In 2020, 37-year-old Amanda Davis, a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe, was living in Nixon, Nevada with her three children. Amanda was described as a devoted mother who always fought to protect her children. She was also pregnant with her fourth child by her boyfriend, 36-year-old Michael Bersiaga. She was super excited about the pregnancy and had already picked out the name Ezra Aaron Davis. Sadly, all that would be taken away from her in December of 2020. Shortly after midnight on December 15th, Amanda's 15-year-old daughter called the police to report that her mom had been stabbed. When officers arrived, the kids told them that Michael had stabbed their mother. When they went into the bedroom, they sadly found Amanda lying face down. When Michael first stabbed Amanda, her eight-year-old son had witnessed it and ran and woke up his older sister. All three kids then rushed to check on their mother and thankfully found her still alive in her bedroom. In a panicked state, they decided to barricade the door with a dresser. Unfortunately, the dresser didn't block the entire door, and when Michael came back to finish Amanda off, he was able to break through the top half. Amanda tried to fend him off with a baseball bat by hitting his hand, but he was still able to get through. Even Amanda's daughter tried hitting him with a lamp, but nothing worked. After a second attack on Amanda, he fled the home. While the officers were on the scene, the kids started screaming, and I quote, He's back, he's back. They rushed them into the kitchen and went outside to find Michael standing there. He had apparently tried to take his own life by cutting one of his wrists. He told officers, and I quote, I already know what happened, and I know what I did, which is why I slit my wrist. After being treated at the hospital, he was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, a violation of the Protection of Unborn Children Act, and domestic assault by a habitual offender. Meanwhile, paramedics tried to save Amanda, but sadly, she died at the scene along with her unborn son, who was due the following February. Michael had a history of domestic assault and domestic battery. In the end, he was convicted for Amanda's murder and sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years. Marcus Jackson Fiesel was born in Middletown, Ohio on June 24, 2003. He lived there with his mother, Donna Trevino, and his siblings, Michael and Peaches. Marcus was said to love flowers, Bob the Builder, and blowing bubbles. He was autistic and attended a school for children with special needs. Unfortunately, Donna's boyfriend was very abusive towards her, making it harder for her to cater to Marcus's needs. The police had even been called out multiple times due to the domestic violence and noted that the house was flea-infested and smelled of feces. On one of those calls on September 29, 2005, police observed severe bruising on Marcus's buttock, which led to an investigation by child welfare workers. In January of 2006, he crawled out a second-story window, fell, and had to have stitches in his chin. In April of 2006, he was found wandering the streets and narrowly avoided being hit by a car. Donna admitted to being overwhelmed and even told police that she wasn't sure she could continue caring for her children. After that, Marcus was placed in the care of foster parents, Liz and David Carroll, who had four children of their own. The process was handled by a private agency called Lifeway for Youth, and they were unaware of David's mental health issues. If they had known, it would have most certainly disqualified them from being foster parents. If that wasn't bad enough, he also had his girlfriend, Amy Baker, living in the home with her three children. In June of 2006, David was arrested on a domestic violence charge, but it was later dismissed, and he failed to report it to Lifeway for Youth. Unfortunately, after Marcus moved in with them, Liz and Amy began focusing all their attention on him, which angered David. Then, in early August of 2006, Marcus strangely disappeared and wasn't reported missing until August 15th. Liz said she had blacked out due to low blood pressure at Julf's Park, and when she woke up, Marcus was gone. Even stranger was the fact that she had three other children with her at the time, and no witnesses at the park recalled seeing Marcus that day. Authorities and volunteers searched the area and the surrounding neighborhoods, but no sign of Marcus was found. At this point, the investigators were questioning Liz's story, and she most likely knew it because, on August 22, 2006, she held a press conference and appealed to the public for Marcus's return. However, it was all a lie, and Amy, who turned state witness, would let the cat out of the bag. 
The real story of what happened to Marcus is a sad, horrible tale. Liz, David, and Amy were heading to a family reunion in Williamstown, Kentucky that took place from August 4th through August 6th. Instead of bringing him along, they wrapped him in a blanket that was wrapped with tape and placed him inside a closet with no food or water. When they returned at the end of the weekend, Marcus was dead. So they took his body to an abandoned 88-acre property with a house that burned in the 1960s that still had the chimney intact. Once there, they put the remains inside the chimney and continued burning them until very little remained. When they felt the remains could be burned no further, they collected what was left and dumped them in the Ohio River. When investigators searched the abandoned property, they found bone fragments still inside the chimney. Those fragments were tested and positively belonged to Marcus. On August 28, 2006, Liz and David were brought in front of a grand jury. After providing their testimony, where Liz had the audacity to say, I didn't have any intentions of hurting him, they were both indicted for Marcus's murder. Amy was granted immunity in Ohio, which is even more shocking when you learn that David and Amy were the ones who burned the remains and dumped what was left in the Ohio River. The following day, on August 29th, the Carrolls, who had already been charged with involuntary manslaughter and endangering children, also had the additional charges of making false alarms and inducing panic. In addition, David was charged with gross abuse of a corpse, and Liz was charged with perjury. In the end, Liz was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to 54 years to life. Here's Liz's mother's reaction to the verdict, who felt that David and Amy were the true villains of the story. My daughter, it was her life. It was my child. It was Amy that did it. Don't nobody care that I will get it. As for David, he took a plea deal and pleaded guilty to murder and gross abuse of a corpse and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. He also said that Amy was the one who bound Marcus. Uh, Amy and I, uh, we wanted to have sex, got, you know, got greedy. Uh, Amy said, you know, take the kids outside, we'll put Marcus down for a nap. Uh, she was supposedly supposed to be putting Marcus down for a nap. Uh, we found out later on that you know, my wife and I, when we found Marcus later on, that she wasn't actually putting him down for a nap. She taped him up and she in a blanket and um, he died. Finally, three months after Liz's trial, on April 20th, 2007, Amy was charged by Kentucky for evidence tampering. They argued that her immunity was only valid in the state of Ohio and that the Ohio River was under Kentucky jurisdiction. Her trial was set for November 7, 2007 in Maysville, Kentucky, but by early 2008, it never happened and all charges were dropped. Meanwhile, Marcus's mother, Donna, decided to capitalize on her son's death and sued the county, Liz, David, Amy, and Lifeway for $5 million. The same month that Liz was found guilty in February of 2007, Donna's suit was settled for $206,000, which was placed in a trust fund to be split between Marcus's siblings, Michael and Peaches, as long as they remained in foster care. If Donna regained custody, she would get the money, but from my research, it doesn't appear she ever tried. After all was said and done, Lifeway for Youth had its license revoked and was forced to close its doors. However, they soon reopened under the name Benchmark, which is still in operation today. Shauna Beth Garber was born in Iola, Kansas on March 1, 1968. Unfortunately, Shauna dealt with abuse from her mother, and in 1973, that abuse escalated beyond the imaginable. Late one night, her mother took Shauna, poured lighter fluid on her, and lit a match. She survived, but was hospitalized to treat the severe burns. After that, she and her half-siblings were placed in the foster care system. After she was discharged from the hospital, she was sent to live with a different foster family than her siblings. At that point, she began bouncing from home to home. A few months after all the children were placed with different foster families, in March of 1974, caseworkers gathered Shauna and Rob to celebrate their birthdays, which were only two days apart. Sadly, that was the last time he saw his sister alive. Rob was the only one of his three half-siblings to be placed with a loving foster family, which provided him with a good life. As we move to talking about Shauna's adult life, I have to inform y'all that there are no photos of her from that time. 
When Rob turned 18, he set out to find his 16-year-old sister and wrote two letters, which he handed over to the Child Welfare Office in Dodge City, hoping they could get them to her. They gave her the first letter immediately, which basically said that Rob loved her and that she could come live with him in two years. The second letter was to be opened when she was 18 and contained all his contact information. When their other half-sibling, Danielle, turned 18, she set out to look for her family as well and discovered Rob first. From there, they searched together for Shauna and eventually were able to track down her first foster family. The foster mother said that when Shauna moved in with her, her face was severely burned and she was in a constant state of panic. The last known details of Shauna are from when she was 22 years old. That year, she visited Claremore, Oklahoma to try to find her family. However, unable to find her half-siblings, she ended up working in McDonald County, Missouri, a couple of hours away. Sadly, she would never get to see her half-siblings again. On Sunday, December 2, 1990, a husband and wife were walking after church along Oscar Talley Road near an abandoned McDonald County farmhouse when they noticed a skull. After calling the police, the rest of the female's remains were found. The woman's body had been bound with several materials, including a phone cord, nylon rope, and a clothesline. Also, her hands had been bound behind her back and tied to one foot. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and murdered about six weeks before being found. The green parachute cord used to strangle her was a military issue sold in the 1990s. Unfortunately, they were unable to identify her, and she became known as Grace Doe. In 2009, her skeletal remains were sent to NamUs, and a DNA profile was created and uploaded to CODIS, but no matches were found. A facial reconstruction was then created, but it didn't help identify her. In 2020, with the help of Othram and Forensic Genetic Genealogy, they were able to identify the remains as belonging to Shauna. After the identification, they called and notified Danielle, who said they had been looking for her for the last 28 years. Shauna had married at some point, and her last name changed to Harvey, but strangely, her husband never reported her missing. It's unknown if they were together when she was murdered. Now that she was identified, investigators got to work tracking down her killer. For three years, they investigated the case and were eventually led to a man named Talfie Reeves. Reeves had a long criminal record dating back to the 1980s, which included first-degree assault and drug trafficking. However, he would never face justice because he died on November 5, 2021, after performing an illegal U-turn that resulted in a fatal car accident. It was his death that prompted a witness to come forward and finally reveal that he was the one who murdered Shauna. On Halloween night in 1990, Reeves picked Shauna up from the side of the road. After picking her up, he hogtied her and took her to the abandoned farmhouse where he proceeded to sexually assault her. All the while, Shauna was screaming for help, and those screams were echoing through the valley. Unfortunately, Reeves was worried the screams would get him caught, so he overdosed her with drugs. If Taffy Reeves was still alive, he would be charged with her murder. Vanessa Teresa Marcotte was born in Leominster, Massachusetts on June 17, 1989, to parents John and Rosanna. After high school, she earned a bachelor's degree in communications from Boston University. She then got a job at an online marketing software startup called WordStream and later worked at Vistaprint. In January 2015, she moved to New York City after getting her dream job as an account manager for Google. In August of 2016, 27-year-old Vanessa went to visit her mother in Princeton, Massachusetts. On Sunday, August 7th, she went for a walk on Brooks Stations Road but never returned. During her walk, she had her headphones in and was texting her cousin Caroline Tochi. At some point, she stopped at the Mountainside Market on Hubbardston Road for a drink and was last seen sometime between 1.15 and 2 p.m. Witnesses would later say that a vehicle had been following her. Later that day, Vanessa's body was sadly discovered less than half a mile from her mother's house. She was found strangled to death in a wooded area and had also been severely beaten. She was naked and her killer had tried to set the remains on fire. Investigators believe the motive was sexual assault. Missing were her clothes, cell phone, and headphones. Thankfully, they were able to collect male DNA from under her fingernails. 
In an attempt to locate her killer, investigators opened a 24-hour tip line and received over 1,300 tips. Two months after her murder, in November 2016, they began asking the public for help in finding a black or dark-colored SUV that had been parked on the road in the area around the time Vanessa was killed. A few months went by with no solid leads until a Massachusetts state trooper in Worcester, about 20 miles from Princeton, happened to see a vehicle that matched the one seen on the day of Vanessa's murder. He wrote down the license plate number and determined it belonged to 31-year-old Angelo Colin Ortiz. The following day, he went by Angelo's home and asked him for a DNA sample, which he voluntarily gave. Lo and behold, his DNA matched the DNA from the crime scene. On April 15, 2017, Angelo was arrested and charged with murder, aggravated assault, and assault with intent to sexually assault. Angelo later claimed that the DNA sample was not voluntary and that he was confused due to a language barrier. However, his attorney's attempts to suppress the DNA evidence were denied. Angelo had no criminal record and was married with three children. He also worked for a third-party contractor of FedEx and delivered packages in the area of the murder. His neighbors weren't surprised by his arrest and described him as a pervert and said he often made vulgar sexual comments to people around the neighborhood. A former female postal worker in Princeton came forward and said that Angelo had made crude comments to her in Spanish and had done the same to other female co-workers as well. Thankfully, a local resident recalled seeing Angelo on the day of Vanessa's murder around 12.45 p.m., standing outside his parked black SUV with the hood up, talking on his cell phone. Cell phone records also backed this up. When the person drove back by at 2.05 p.m., the SUV was still there, but the hood was back down and no one was around. Six minutes later, Vanessa's phone was shut off. Investigators also discovered that he purchased $5 worth of gas from a store in Rutland, about six miles away. This is important because he attempted to use gas to try and burn her remains, and it was found on her hair tie and socks. Since Angelo was not working that day, it's unclear why he was in the area. However, considering that Vanessa left her mother's home around 1 p.m. and Angelo was seen parked on the side of the road 15 to 30 minutes earlier, could he have been waiting for her? I did read that she used to travel to Princeton a couple of times a month to visit her mother and aunt, so it's possible he had seen her before. In the end, Angelo pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment with eligibility for parole after 45 years. Jacob Patrick Cullen Shane was born in Hendricks County, Indiana on July 20, 2013, to Alyssa and Jesse Cullen. In 2017, four-year-old Jacob was living with his mother and five-year-old sister at his home in Danville, Indiana, along with her boyfriend, 23-year-old Michael Atkinson, and his two children, ages one and three. Jacob was diagnosed with high-functioning autism, OCD, and defiance disorder and required medication. He was said to be a very active child who could be difficult to control at times. In early November 2017, Jacob was sick with a fever and runny nose and had even vomited once. By November 11th, he was improving but still wasn't quite himself. Alyssa decided to take her children to the mall to spend time with their grandmother. While there, everything with Jacob appeared fine. Later that evening, she left her children with Michael so she could attend a concert with friends. Around 10.30 that night, Michael sent Alyssa a text that read, 911, please call. After he spoke with Alyssa, instructing her to come home immediately, he called 911 and reported that Jacob was unconscious in the home. When officers and paramedics arrived, they found Jacob and began performing CPR. Once they had him revived, they rushed him to the hospital and placed him on a ventilator. Sadly, two days later, he died from his injuries. Doctors would find that Jacob had bruises all over the back of his head and knee. The doctor overseeing his case also determined that Jacob most likely suffered from internal bleeding and a shattered spleen. When Alyssa arrived at the hospital, she told the doctor his wounds were self-inflicted, but the doctor wasn't buying it and relayed his suspicions to investigators. They asked Michael to walk them through the events of the night. He said that Jacob had an accident, so he put him in the shower to clean him up. For some reason, he left him there and only returned after he heard a thud. 
When he went back into the bathroom at 6.16 p.m., he said Jacob had fallen and hit his head and there was blood in the tub. He said afterward at about 7 p.m., Jacob seemed fine and went into the living room to watch a movie. However, he began complaining that his stomach and head were hurting. Then around 10.30, he said that Jacob's breathing changed. At 11 p.m., he put him to bed and then claimed when he went back to check on him 15 minutes later, he found him unresponsive. The biggest problem with his story is that it conflicts with his text to Alyssa at 10.30 p.m. asking her to call 911. Why would he tell her to call 911 and then put the boy to bed 30 minutes later? During the investigation, Alyssa continued to defend Michael. However, one of the other children in the home said there were crashing sounds in the bathroom when Jacob got hurt. Meanwhile, DCS had Michael's two children removed from the home. When the autopsy came back on January 11, 2018, it blew a hole right in Michael's story. The autopsy showed that Jacob died from multiple blunt force traumatic injuries, and his death was ruled a homicide. Investigators searched the home and found blood on the bath rug, bath towels, and the pillows on Jacob's bed. They also obtained video from a nanny cam that was in Jacob's room, but strangely, some of the footage had been deleted or the recording was paused. Regardless, the video they did have didn't show Michael coming back to check on Jacob. Michael was then arrested and charged with aggravated battery, resulting in the death and neglect of a dependent. Come to find out, multiple family members and friends were aware of the abuse against Jacob. However, it's unclear if they ever reported it to DCS. In the end, the jury found Michael guilty on all the counts, and he was sentenced to 65 years behind bars. 